Thanks so much. Um, so welcome everybody to this UXL Foundation Community Webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us. And my name is Rod Burns. I'm the chair for the Foundation Steering Committee. And today on this webinar, I'm joined by the other members um, of the Steering Committee. And um, we're going to spend some time talking to you about why we feel the UXL Foundation is really important, uh, what's been happening in the past six months or so, uh, how you can get involved, and also what our members are planning in the, the coming months and, and even years. Uh, if you have any questions or want to start discussions after the webinar, you can join our foundation Slack workspace. Um, as Candy said during the uh, the webinar, if you if you want to ask any questions throughout, then you can do that through the, the QA bar. So here's a little agenda for what we're going to cover today. So I'll start off with a bit of an introduction to the foundation for those of you who don't know too much about it. Um, and then some of my colleagues here from the foundation will introduce themselves and talk about the projects, talk about the specification um, and the groups that exist and um, around that. After this, we'll have a little bit of a one-to-one um, -one with the steering committee members. They'll talk about how they're getting involved and what they're planning um, and things like that. And the last thing that we'll cover is um, the ways that you, you can get involved. Okay, so I just want to cover a bit about the context and of, of how we got to this, this point in, in forming this, this foundation. So the, the landscape of computing is changing. Um, the majority of top supercomputers have been designed to make use of multiple types of processors. Um, and at the moment, this is usually um, in the form of GPUs with CPUs being used as the host to drive the, the processing of huge amounts of, uh, of data on, uh, on GPU. But not only that, the emergence of modern AI techniques, large language models and things like that has further accelerated the usage um, of GPUs in particular, um, and allows them to do um, the sorts of things that were not really previously possible because they lack the, the amount of processing powers for, for things like neural network. So alongside GPUs, there's also um, specific AI processors that are being designed. Um, I think people have heard of FPGA processors, so programmable um, silicon, um, and some of those are being used in specific algorithms in, in a lot of different spaces. So what this really means is that there's a demand for acceleration using architectures that consist of lots of different types of processors. And one thing that I've included here is from a survey. So the Evans Data Corporation does a survey every year. And last year they found that 70% of the developers that they, they surveyed um, are targeting heterogeneous systems. And by that, they mean a system that uses more than one kind of processor or core. Um, so this information is from 2023, so it's highly likely that this has increased, obviously, into, into 2024. So the challenge that we have is that developers don't want to program in different ways for different devices, in particular across vendors. So the challenge that we're currently seeing is that different architectures typically require unique languages, tools, and libraries. And this adds complexity and limits the amount of code reuse that's, that's possible. And um, this makes it difficult for them to then to take advantage of these multi-architecture systems and to adopt new architectures and, and uh, incorporate inefficiencies when you're trying to maintain code um, and bring application performance. So the solution that we realized that was needed is to provide a single way to develop across these architectures um, and to use open standards um, and open source as the basis um, for this, this programming methods. So the UXL Foundation was formed to tackle this and, and we're working together to build a solution to, to, to address this, providing an open standards-based multi-architecture way to develop software and deploy this code across different vendor processors. So the, the UXL Foundation is committed to developing a framework that is open and scalable for both current and next generation of processors. 
And I guess the thing that I also want to highlight is that we're not starting from a clean slate. So the foundations receive major contributions in the form of both a specification um, and a set of open source projects that are being, being used already to target processors from multiple vendors and, and architectures. So right now, developers can use the libraries that we develop alongside a SQL and C++ LLVM-based compiler to write code that can be run on processors from AMD, ARM, Intel, and NVIDIA in particular. And in fact, developers in both research institutes and commercial organizations are deploying co code that makes use of those capabilities. The foundation, however, is now bringing together both hardware companies and software companies to take these projects to the next level by adding more vendor targets and evolving the projects to meet the needs of the next generation of AI and uh, HPC applications. And you'll hear a bit later about some of the major contributions that have been made already this year by Fujitsu, um, and we expect to see more of these throughout the year. So ultimately, our goal is to deliver the building blocks that the majority of developers need so that they can build applications that achieve great performance regardless of the, the vendor or, or, or architecture. So this is the UXL Foundation mission. Um, we're building a multi-architecture, multi-vendor software ecosystem for all, all accelerators. And as I say, this aims to provide all the fundamental building blocks that you would need to build accelerated applications. Um, the key thing as well is that our ethos is based around delivering this using industry-defined open standards. So our libraries are implemented using the, the SQL open standards, which is something that's defined by the Kronos group. Um, and our library APIs are based on an open specification as well. So the, the third fundamental point that, that, I, that I want to talk about is that we're building on and expanding existing projects that are being used um, in production and, and by commercial companies as well. I think the other thing I'd like to add is what's clear is the community needs to get behind an open standard-based multi-vendor way to develop software for accelerators. Um, and this is the best way to achieve compatibility for hardware that's available now, but also is going to be available um, in the future. I think ultimately open ecosystems create these horizontal platforms um, for the next generation of innovation and open technologies have powered previous decades of innovation and I think will continue to power the coming decades as well. So we want people to have choice, the choice of the vendor that they choose, the choice of the architectures that they want to, um, to be able to have the, the best system that they, that they can use for, for a specific application. So we want you to come together with us to support that, bringing this open source, uh, open standards based uh, platform um, for the accelerator um, ecosystem. So this is just to give you an idea of the organizations um, that we've brought together so far to participate in this effort. And you can see we've got some of the largest, most influential hardware companies. And we're lucky to, to have representatives from, from the, those um, organizations on the, the webinar today. Um, so we've got deep expertise in hardware, but we also have very deep expertise in integrating and writing software from cloud service um, even through to, to automotive companies that you can see there. Um, and your own organization be, can be part of this as well by joining at one of our membership levels. Uh, these start from, from $0, so there's really no excuse not to get involved. Um, and anyone can join, regardless of who you are or the size of your organization. We're also working on an easier way for uh, universities and nonprofit organizations uh, to join up with us through um, collaboration agreements as well. So I'll talk a bit about the foundation governance. And um, so the foundation governance was agreed by um, the original steering committee, which was something that existed prior to the formation of this foundation. Um, we chose to use a template structure, uh, something that's called the Joint Development Foundation 
This is part of the Linux Foundation and provides a set of standard terms, um, member agreements and things like that. And it's already used by a bunch of other successful Linux Foundation projects. Um, and it's designed for projects incorporating standards definition, which is one of the things that, um, that our foundation does alongside the, the open source projects. The steering committee is formed of our steering members. Um, most of them are joining us today. It takes care of the uh, high level decision making and direction for the foundation. And um, for example, the group has the uh, responsibility to approve work packages, spec revisions, um, and also set the, the strategy for the foundation. So alongside this, we have groups that are dealing with more detailed pieces of work. Uh, the working groups exist to help steer and define those work packages that are necessary. Um, and the groups also solicit feedback and, and discuss that feedback and bring that into the projects and specification too. And we also have special interest groups or six as you call them. Um, and these exist as a more informal place for the community to gather where presentations are made on a, a range of topics um, around certain core areas um, to these being AI, hardware, language, math, and, and safety critical. We'll talk a bit more about those six and hear from them from one of our steering committee members as well. Um, anyone can participate in the SIGs um, and contribute to the um, open source projects, um, but you'll need to join as a member to participate um, in the working groups. Okay, so the I talked a bit about how the foundation's building on you know an existing uh, established base. So we're building on this existing specification um, and existing open standards. So the one API specification has been contributed to the foundation, forms the basis of our of our current projects. Alongside this, the projects build on the SICL standard. Uh, this is something that's managed by the Kronos Group, an independent standards body. Um, SICL is what the projects use to implement much of the cross-vendor, cross-architecture capabilities um, that, are, that are needed. And most of these elements of the specification um, are implemented as open source projects um, that are also governed uh, by the foundation. So the projects aim to deliver the fundamental building blocks for developers. Um, the one DNM project brings operations required by AI frameworks like TensorFlow or, or PyTorch, um, and this delivers targets for ARM, AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA. The one MKL project implements a wide range of math operators uh, required for you know, lots of different applications from big science projects through to, to AI frameworks that, that require accelerated blasts, for example. Um, and as our base is in industry standards, there's also a project called One DPL that implements uh, ISO standard um, C++ parallel routines, and that has targets for for multiple processor types as well. So our goal really here is to to build uh, to continue to drive this vendor neutral ecosystem uh, for open accelerated compute. Um, we do this in conjunction with other standard bodies and groups. Um, and we're doing this by building on the momentum that was created by this original, um, if you call it one API initiative out of which these projects were born. And so demand for the capabilities of this is very strong due to you know, the recent growth of AI, but it's relevant for you know, the, the vast majority of, of industry verticals and we see that um, across, across everywhere. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background on where the foundations come from, as uh, so you can see this, this journey that we've taken, uh, the journey started in 2019 when at uh, the actual, actually at the annual supercomputing conference, the one API specification was published. Um, and that was when sort of feedback group was set up to get feedback from the community. And um, so that was originally was a, a closed group. Over the next year, a few years, the specification evolved with new groups um, with, with more members joining those groups and um, holding developer events um, um, to, to help build the community up. And alongside this, the open source projects for the specification elements were, were made available on GitHub. And um, initially the targets were um, predominantly for Intel processors as the projects were being led by Intel, but over the next few years, this has expanded to 
include NVIDIA and AMD GPU targets, um, as well as ARM CPU targets for some of the projects. Um, the libraries have been adopted you know, quite broadly across the industry. Um, and this is thanks to the, the commercial releases that have been made um, through, through Intel. So now that the foundation has been formed, uh, the governance of the specifications and the projects has been moved to the Linux Foundation and the UXL Foundation. Um, and this is what's driving the expansion of the, the collaborations, bringing new targets um, and getting more people involved in, in working on these. So we'd be really excited to see the rest of the industry getting behind these efforts and, and helping us to, to build these. Um, so I just want to talk about a small number of um, projects that are already taking advantage of the libraries that, um, that the foundation um, is governing. So the Gromax project, which is a big science application, and actually one of the most popular projects in the world is using the 1MKL library for, for portable math operations. Uh, both PyTorch and TensorFlow are using the 1DNM project to set, accelerate graph optimization uh, through their frameworks. Uh, the Ginkgo project is a linear algebra library um, and has some ongoing work to use both 1MKL and 1DPL to enable some optimized for math routines that can run um, across different vendor targets. Um, the last one's really about this kind of a, a broader activity happening within the newest national labs um, where there are lots of different laboratories with different uh, supercomputers and clusters often with different vendor processors. And they're using, uh, in particular, the 1MKL project, but also SQL generally, and um, to help them to deploy uh, software across different machines from, from different vendors, um, including Aurora Machine, uh, Paramutter, Polaris, and, and Frontier. So this is just a sample of some of the, the projects that are taking advantage of, of the libraries already. Um, so as I've said, it's possible to use libraries today. You can download a binary package, which is called the One API Based Toolkit, um, but you can also build the projects from from the open source repositories and target different processes from different vendors. So I'd encourage you to to have a go with that if you're if you're a developer. Um, okay, so I'll I'll finish on on this point. So. Another area that's really important for us as a, an organization is to, to build collaborations with different organizations to, that have um, in common goals. So most of the software that we're developing has, or sorry, most software generally um, has a set of dependencies and the projects that we are working on are no different. So we have some very strong dependencies in particular with C++, but also with the, the SQL standard and SQL's um, C++-based uh, programming model, as I said, defined by the Pronos group. And the UXL projects use a compiler, um, generally one that's called DPC++. This implements SQL um, and is used to, to compile those, those, um, those libraries and, and the code that's used. So our, our goal really is to set up alliances and collaborations with a bunch of different groups. We have an ongoing um, uh, agreement that we're signing up with the Kronos group. Um, we're also working on um, projects with some, some other groups as well. So we're hoping to build um, much stronger bonds with some of these groups. So if you um, are part of or involved in, in some of these groups, we'd, we'd love to talk to you about, about how we can collaborate on, um, on specific projects uh, with you. Okay, so I think you've heard probably enough uh, from me for now. So. I'm going to hand over to some of my um, esteemed colleagues that we have uh, on the call here. So um, we have um, Andy Wafa and, and Robert Cohn. Um, these two are our chairs of some of our working groups. So I guess I'll hand over to them. They can introduce themselves and, and talk a bit about some of the, the work that's ongoing. Thanks, Rod. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Andy Woffer. Uh, I uh, co chair the Open Source Working Group. Um, that working group is focused on uh, four primary packages, uh, ensuring that the governance um, 
of the open source uh, projects held within UXL Foundation are um, well uh, well driven, uh, implementing best practices, the security aspects, etc. Uh, we also look after the uh, or help uh, define and drive the CI/CD aspect of the projects to ensure that we have the greatest coverage possible, uh, and look at uh, other aspects of ensuring that the open source side of things uh, work as well as possible uh, and are easily adoptable uh, by both developers and, and companies uh, globally. Um, it's open to, uh, to all to participate in, uh, and we welcome uh, others to join in the fun. Uh, we're a friendly bunch, so don't don't be afraid of us. We won't bite. I promise. Um, and so that, that's one part of the uh, of the working groups. The other part of the working group specification working group, and um, and for that I'll pass over to my colleague um, Robert. Oh, hi, thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm Robert Cohn. I've been um, editor for the One API spec since 2019. And um, I'm continuing as editor for one of the spec as part of UXL. And uh, the, the specs are really closely related to the open source projects that Andy was describing. And the, the reason to have these separate specification is that it made it easier for people to get involved. If you're not a um, implementer of these libraries, but you, you may be a user, then you still have a lot of valuable feedback in terms of directions for the kinds of functionality and how it should be expressed. And that's really the work that goes on the specification. And it's, it's open source, specifications open source, just like the projects themselves, just like the code. And um, the, the issues are um, uh, the sources in GitHub and you know, people discuss the, the development of the APIs in, in GitHub and in other channels, we have Slack as well. So it's really just um, if you want to get involved, you, you don't have to be implementing the libraries themselves, but just be participating in the design of the APIs. It's you're welcome to join. And um, in terms of the work that's going on, it's really that we have a we have separate specifications, and the you know, we come together to coordinate on things like how to publish and how to coordinate release schedules and things like that. And um, you know, it's maybe it's like a starting point for how to get connected to the other ones if if you want to get more involved. And I think that's about it. Uh, Rod, do you want to continue? Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Robert. Uh, okay. So, um, Hempor is going to talk a bit about the special interest groups um, that we have going. So, um, please introduce yourself and. Tell us a bit more about that, thanks. Yes, uh, hi, I'm Finn Pan from Google. I co-share the AI SIG with Jin Hui Li from Intel. So um, we have a total of five special interest groups so far. So the first one is language, covering um, languages for accelerate computing. So um, in, and in the group, oh, all, all five SIGs are meeting about once a quarter and we try to um, over, not overlap each of the SIGs. So if you want to attend more than one calls, you can do that. And let me go back to the components again, sorry. Yeah, so the language six will cover topics like SQL programming models, um, DPC++ language, and one, one, uh, one DPL, which is uh, one, one API data parallel plus plus DPC++ library. Um, and the hardware SIG uh, is covering, um, exp um, covering expanding one, it, one, one UXL into covering more hardware data, and it, it involves um, software like components like one API construction kit and level zero, which is hardware abstraction layer. Um, the third SIG is the MAT SIG covering uh, MAT operations such as sparse and dense linear algebra, di discrete Fourier transform, and, and, not, and that kind of stuff. So example components being discussed is M one MKL in here. Um, the fourth one is AI, we will be discussing um, our broad range of things regarding AI, and it could involve um, the 1DNN li library, and also even DPC++ and level zero, as well as we will cover how we can integrate um, accelerators into AI, AI high-level AI frameworks. 
And the last one is the newly minted SIG called Safety Critical. Safety Critical, sorry. Um, and this is uh, this SIG cover functional safety topics, and it will discuss integration of UXL components into safety critical systems, such as in cars and planes. And returning to you, Rod. Thanks, Pampar. That's great. Okay, so I think now we're going to go some individual spotlights to talk a bit about um, their organizations, how they're involved, um, and everything else. So all the people that are going to be talking are steering members, so they're part of the steering committee, um, and they've been doing generally some work around the, the UXL Foundation. So I think we're starting with um, Dr. Priyanka Sharma from Fujitsu first. Um, yeah, please introduce yourself and, and I'll see your, your colleague as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Rod. Uh, so my name is Priyanka Sharma and uh, I work as Director of Software Engineering of, uh, uh, and Head of the Monaka uh, Software R&D Unit of Fujitsu Research of India. And uh, uh, with me, I have Dutabuchi Mashairo, who is also representing Fujitsu as a part of the same unit. And uh, I'm proud to be working with, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the software R&D unit that, was, that has also contributed to developing world's fastest supercomputer, which was which is for GACO. Uh, I think till 2021, for four consecutive terms, it had ranked at number one and currently at number four and number one on various other benchmarks like graph 500 and hpcg uh, now monaka is our uh, next uh, project that the entire team is focused at delivering um, uh, and with monaka we are working towards uh, using fujitsu's uh, legacy in making its own micro architecture and uh, plus 3D medicore architecture and a combination of confidential computing at hardware and software stack level both to come up with a two nanometer chip that will be high performance. Uh, it will be supporting energy efficiency, high reliability and easy to use software stack. And uh, with in order to meet up this vision, we have a, a vision we have, we are collaborating with the Linux Foundation's UXL uh, foundation and uh, you know co uh, collaborating with uh, multiple other companies in order to develop a stack that is able to that's wide enough to handle large amount of uh, uh, you know use case ecosystem and uh, with this i also wanted to mention that uh, fujitsu has been committed to collaborating with open source communities right from 2005 where we contributed towards making our Linux kernel for mission critical servers to the contributions that we made for KVM and virtualization in 2010 to OpenStack and Kubernetes in 2018, uh, to the way we collaborated with Rikain Labs in Japan for porting 1DNN for ARM ecosystem. And this was basically used in supercomputer for GACO way back in 2021. And uh, in 2021, our contributions towards automotive grade Linux, Yocto, and uh, uh, and uh, the very recent contribution is uh, um, how our team has worked towards enabling Wandal for ARM ecosystem. Um, so uh, with Wandal, what we have done is we have we have focused towards accelerating the ML workloads on ARM, where our team has worked towards replacing some of the MKL calls with open source function calls. And uh, with this, uh, we have succeeded in uh, uh, enabling the Wandal stack for ARM ecosystem. And there are many others in uh, pipeline. We are very closely collaborating with the one API team of Intel and uh, the software team of ARM to work towards enabling various other stacks for Monaka chip. Um, I would also like to mention that uh, we are, uh, our commitment is to continue to work towards expanding our software stack with various OSS communities, with our partners to develop a easy to use software ecosystem. And uh, it's also important to mention here that Monaka project is supported by NIDO, which is New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization. It's a national level research and development agency of Japan, Japan government. 
And uh, with Monaka ARM CPU, we are focused to meet future computing demands of performance, power, reliability, and usability to support wide range of usage in data center, which includes AI and HPC both. And uh, we'll also be working towards contributing to the realization of carbon neutral society by our computing technologies and collaborations with users and partners. We are really excited to be a part of a uh, steering committee member of UXL Foundation, and we look forward to see uh, many more participation uh, in this community. We need to work towards growing it wider and wider and work jointly towards democratizing the use of AI. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Okay, so next up we have um... And Barney's going to talk again for a little bit about um, yeah her involvement with activities at Google. Yeah, I am back again. So Google has been um, using one DNN and one MKL library in our software components. So uh, firstly, in TensorFlow, we started integrated with integrating with one DNN as early as twenty seventeen, which is which was before it became one DNN. This is still become it was MKL DNN. And uh, we used it to accelerate performance of x86 CPUs. And later on, when both ARM and Fujitsu, thank you so much for your contributions, contributed to the 1DNN uh, AR64 backend. We also use that uh, optimization for the uh, AR64 CPU as well. And, and later on, we also added Intel GPU plugins, which is based on, uh, which is using 1DNN and also DPC and level zero um, to add support for Intel GPU for bot free software. So quick introduction. So TensorFlow is um, our AI machine learning framework. JAX is another one, which is um, uh, another high level machine learning framework, which targets um, making it easy to do scientific developments. It, you can think of it as NumPy for uh, NumPy with AutoGrad. And OpenXLA is our most recent component extracted from TensorFlow. It's our uh, lower level machine learning compiler. And all three software are using um, these the one DNN libraries, and also on the cloud side, our cloud HPC toolkit also includes the one uh, one MKL library for users to use as well. Good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pen uh, for the for the update. Okay. Next, we have uh, Dave from Imagination. So, um, tell us a bit about yourself and. Um, Tell us what your organization's going to be up to. Hey, thanks, Rob. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, yeah, Dave Barry from, I'm product manager at uh, Imagination Technologies um, based in the UK. Um, I'm responsible for the AI and compute software strategy um, and how we effectively enable our customers to be successful in deploying our GPU IP for AI and compute applications. Um, so Imagination has a long and strong history in, in deployment of IP, GPU IP, CPU IP, AI IP. So we recognize the, the heterogeneous problem that customers have. Um, and you know, we, we've also got a strong history in working in open software standards um, Kronos is an area we've been heavily involved with uh, is to ensure the customers have the right uh, APIs for software development. Um, so support for OpenCL um, and Vulkan on our GPU, for example, for compute and AI applications. So really, we you know, UXL is a perfect fit for us. Um, we view it as the next great step along with one, one API and DPC++ as the next great step for customers seeking to deploy performant compute and AI applications um, onto the heterogeneous SOC platforms, um, but also having a solution that gives them an effective way of um, rapidly developing, going on that developer journey, um, from functional to performant to optimized applications um, and the long tail of, um, of optimization. On the um, technical side, our focus at the moment is one MKL and one DNN. Um, we have um, engineers actively working working with those and, and also Cyclomatic as a way of 
taking existing existing CUDA source code um, and converting to SQL. Um, and we see a strong interest in our automotive customers in particular uh, and their, their OEM end users um, in having access to that those technologies and the ability to perhaps go from uh, something that was prototyped in CUDA in, into SQL in a, in a rapid way. So we've kind of rolled up our sleeves, jumped into the steering committee and into the code, um, trying to actively promote um, the use of um, the use of one API for automotive, initially for automotive applications. Um, and one of the first initiatives that we're we, we've been pushing um, within the steering co with other members who have an interest in automotive is to say, well, how how can we take another open um, software stack for automotive um, and build a project that leverages one API? Um, so delighted that, that we, we can say that this is a, a project that will will kick off soon together with AutoWare Foundation, um, and we'll be we'll be actively involved with that with some of the other steering co members. Um, and I think that's the important thing is that we start to have community involvement, other projects, so you, you can start to see applications um, for other domains um, on top of one API. So just to, to finish off there, I guess one, one of the questions I've been asked a lot by people um, when we talk about one API in UXL is, will, will it be successful? Uh, and my response is always yes, but we need to get involved. We need to encourage adoption. We we, we see lots of customers interested. So um, please get involved um, and come and join us on, the, on these projects. There's some very interesting stuff happening. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Yeah, no, I think the the AutoWare project we're hoping to be able to talk a bit more about that soon, and that's um, that's definitely an exciting thing uh, for us to to be able to do. Okay, so um, now we have Robert from Intel. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about about what your involvement is. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, um, you know, Intel's developing GPUs. MPUs and you know CPUs as accelerators as well, and you know I see from the Q and A that a lot of other companies or individuals also developing accelerators, and we all have this same problem that we need the low level software and we need to plug into ecosystems, and um, so Intel was was doing this for its GPUs and was had adopted open source from the very beginning, and um, you know, at with the UXL, what what what's happening is Intel contributed a lot of the initial you know, all the initial projects for UXL, and covering areas like uh, math, AI, AI, data parallel computing, and distributed computing as well. And so, um, you, know, you know, I think more projects are coming from Intel and other other um, you know, other entities, and you know, really looking for that as UXL grows beyond just this initial uh, core that came from one API. And um, you know, that's that's really what we're hoping to happen. And so we as I said, we've been we had adopted open source from the beginning, but the change to UXL for us is really about this idea of open governance where you know, every every partner in that project can be can be like truly equal and you can you know, contribute with confidence and and so we're, we think that's really important and we support that. And so we're, um, you know, Intel's activity in the project is to switch over to this real, you know, truly follow open governance. And that's why we're so excited to be part of UXL and LF and have these, um, these partners. Uh, thanks, Brad. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's a big, big change in terms of a lot of open source projects and something that we're going through is the idea of open decision making and um letting everybody have a a voice and a level playing field so that's that's really important okay um next we have um uh, vinesh um yeah please tell us a bit about yourself and and introduce qualcomm's activities please 
Hi, um, can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, hi, I'm Manesh. Uh, I lead the AI product team at Qualcomm. Uh, just a quick introduction to the audience. Uh, Qualcomm uh, launches plenty of applications uh, in every given year that is mapped across multiple client SOCs from um, handsets all the way to complex systems like uh, uh, automotive devices or automotive platforms. And our intention is uh, we strongly believe in open source uh, contributions and community because when you try to launch these applications, we really want to be in a position to provide our ecosystem partners and developers the flexibility of you know being able to program on a multi-architecture kind of ecosystem. Because uh, from a Qualcomm perspective, uh, we enable applications which are uh, you know in the realm of uh, data panel compute engines like CPU and graphics, and also domain-specific accelerators, which are very DSP-oriented or acceleration units built on top of it. And our expectation is, you know, and by participating in uh, foundations like um, UXL, you'll be in a position to unify these uh, heterogeneous compute platforms across with open standards. And uh, Qualcomm has been a strong proponent of open standards. We've seen this at the active participations in Kronos with the contributions in OpenCL. We kind of tend to uh, expand on that. And our expectation is this is a good initiative with, with uh, you know, a lot of companies actually participating in this front where we can actually expand on opportunities to support uh, common programming model and also transition from a time to market in terms of uh, application deployment. That's great. Thanks, thanks Vinesh, for telling us a bit more. Um, lots of important issues uh, that we can hopefully help your organization to solve too. Um, okay, well, I'm grateful to have everybody from the steering committee here. We've got a um, really good representation to the webinar, so thanks very much. But I'm especially grateful to our our next steering committee member, Han Wing, who's um, awake quite late in the evening. So thank you, Han Wing, for being here. Um, please tell us a bit about yourself and the sort of activities that you've been involved in. Thanks. Okay. Uh, it's an honor to present in front of all of you here, even though it's after midnight in my time zone. Um, I'm Hanung Zhong and working at Samsung Electronics as a software engineer. Uh, I'd like to shortly talk about two perspectives why we joined to USL Foundation. The first perspective is about the processing memory and processing new memory techniques. I'm sure everyone here had heard about uh, PIM and PNM technologies at some point but you may not have thought about how the software to use it's, uh, I mean, how how we develop the software for such a PIM or PNM techniques. We won't talk about details now because it will take too much time, but one thing is for sure, uh, we need to make it easy for software developers to use it through uh, various private models that we widely uh, that are widely used by uh, uh, software developers. So, so we recently worked with uh, Codeplay to propose the vendor extension of SQL to allow it to use our PIM hardware. And also we are currently working with uh, its Kronos extension to provide uh, unified uh, support for PIM and PNM. Uh, so we expect that such extensions of SQL will make it easier for software developers to use PIM and PNM devices developed by other companies, such as uh, Samsung Electronics. The other perspective is about the deep learning software. Uh, we are currently working on a deep learning compiler and runtime that support the unification of the different types of AI accelerators and systems developed by Samsung, Samsung Electronics. Of course, this is not just for us, but for other companies and communities as well. Uh, developing such software from the scratch would be uh, very challenging for everyone. So we are uh, leveraging unified runtime and one DNN in the one API project to develop our runtime. We expect that it allows us to easily support not only, not only our accelerators, but also many different accelerators from the other companies. 
I hope that we can release our uh, deep learning compiler and runtime uh, framework as an open source project within this year. Uh, with UXL, uh, we expect the, the open collaboration will boost uh, the programming models and software stacks to accelerate AI and HPC applications on uh, AI accelerators and PIM PNM devices, and also RISC V CPU and accelerators, uh, which are developed by our company. Okay, thank you. So thanks, Hanwin. Um, exciting to see some new technology that could be um, used in the future. And I've certainly seen some of the results from experiments with that. It looks, um, looks like it's going to be uh, going to be good. OK, and last but not least, we have uh, Ramesh. Thanks, Ramesh, for joining us. Please yeah, tell us a bit about yourself and, and your involvement. Thanks, Rod. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, perfect. Hi everyone, uh, Ramesh Radhakrishnan. I am part of the AI and Advanced Services um, group at VMware, where we uh, lead the AI strategy for, for our company. So open source and uh, community participation has been a core part of uh, VMware's culture over the past 25 years. Uh, we contribute to diverse projects like Kubernetes, Linux, and TensorFlow. And we also you know, solve technical challenges in the areas of blockchain, AI machine learning, data science, and uh, release those ideas as open source projects as well. So you know, for folks that are familiar with VMware, uh, you know that our core value over the past you know, couple of decades has been in the ability to provide abstraction of different hardware resources and optimize performance uh, by scheduling, uh, resource scheduling at the cluster level in a dynamic manner. So as we get into the you know, era of heterogeneous computing becoming more pervasive, uh, thanks to you know, chat GPT and all the excitement around Gen AI uh, and being adopted across all industries and verticals, um, we are seeing customers kind of face the same challenges uh, in the AI stack where uh, they want these applications or their applications to run efficiently across all these different uh, hardware devices. Um, Rod, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So last year we announced uh, our AI strategy, which is focused around private AI and a uh, few product offerings. Uh, and since then we have seen a significant enthusiasm from customers and partners. So as you can see, this is a very uh, broad ecosystem with different layers across different uh, partners. And you know our customers are excited by the flexibility that we provide uh, through this growing open ecosystem. So one of the key values that they see is the ability to offer centralized management and operations for both you know, AI workloads as well as you know, traditional workloads, which is where VMware has um, you know, built up uh, all our innovation in the past. So now we want to enable uh, customers uh, to virtualize and share you know, GPU and accelerator resources, which can enable them to provide which, which can enable them to realize a much better TCO. So the way that we do it is that we enable our partners um, and give them opportunities to differentiate and add value in the AI stack. So we're working with um, independent software vendors in the AI space and uh, enable them to offer, to reach customers on this differentiated platform. We work with system integrators, um, to enable customers to deploy different use cases, all of this on top of our um, you know, private AI cloud foundation platform. So as we heard today you know, from multiple uh, speakers, you know, the UXL foundation will define a vendor neutral way to develop software for heterogeneous architectures. So by embracing you know, vendor neutrality and independence, you know, uh, our track record of streamlining interoperability between hardware and software aligns with uh, UXL's mission. And we are looking forward to working more closely 
and enabling uh, these runtimes and libraries to on our stack to enable customers to uh, optimize performance and leverage uh, these disparate hardware devices. Thanks, Rod. Okay, thanks, Ramesh. That, was, that sounds great. Okay, um, so I think the the only remaining thing that we wanted to go through is just to talk a bit about how you can contribute and how you can get involved. Um, <clears throat> there's a few different ways that you can contribute to the foundation projects. Um, maybe obvious, some people maybe less obvious to others, but you can bring your feedback. Um, that's really, really important. Um, a good way to improve the specification, improve the projects, um, improve our processes, improve our documentation, and everything else. So um, please, you know, come and submit issues on the projects um, for the teams to, the maintainers to, to, to look at and, and to, to work on, uh, join the special interest groups. Um, so you don't need to be a member to join the special interest groups. Um, you can come and, and join those calls. Um, anybody's, you know, uh, free to do that. You can come and join the working groups. Um, as I said, the membership uh, levels, which I'll cover on the next slide, start from nothing. So there's not really any excuse um, for you to not get involved. And um, that's where the the driving of you know the changes and and project work happens. Um, you can also contribute to project RFCs. So um, the majority of the projects work on um, RFCs on the GitHub repo, so you can come and contribute to those and you can give feedback on uh, architectural changes or new features or things like that. So so please um, please do that. Um, you can contribute to the project. So um, all the projects have an issue tracker that has you know enhancements or places where the project needs help. You can obviously join in and maybe spot some gaps that would help you um, and try to fill some of those. Um, you can expand hardware support. So if you have your own uh, processor target or something like that, then you can come and work with the projects um, to add your own your own targets for that. Um, you can also help us with documentation. Um, oftentimes, documentation is better written by people using the project. So you know we obviously welcome you to come in and give that sort of feedback. Um, the last area that's um, really important as well is we're in the process of setting up this um, this foundation now. Build infrastructure is really important. Um, it's going to take us a little bit of time to set up all the infrastructure that we want, but we also want um, the community to contribute their own resources that can do CI testing and build and things like that for either your own hardware um, or for things that we don't already test. So there's an opportunity for you to um, to provide uh, provide that as well. Um, and yeah, this gives you an idea of the membership level. So you can join as a steering member. Um, that's the fee. Um, in addition to the fees for the steering and general members, you do need to be a Linux Foundation member as well. Um, at the steering level, you get a seat on the steering committee, as you'd expect. You obviously have an opportunity to influence the direction of the foundation. Um, you have voting rights um, that come alongside that as well. Um, so that's obviously a way to have an influential role. General members um, have voting rights within the working groups um, and have the ability to uh, to influence the project work packages um, and to do co-marketing with us um, as an organization as well. Um, contributor members, free to join. There's no Linux membership required. So you can sign the, the member agreement and the contributor agreement, which means you can join the working groups and you can participate in the working groups and the um, the packages, the work packages that exist there. And um, so that's obviously a really kind of low touch way to um, to get involved. So um, I guess the last thing I wanted to put up here is please join us. Here's a couple of QR codes that might make things easier. You can join our mailing list. You can join our Slack. Um, if you want to get in touch with anyone, you can do that through those, those channels. The mailing list will also tell you about when different meetings are happening um, and um, and general news on, on specific um, projects or areas that you're interested in. 
Uh, we obviously have our web properties as well, so you can go in there and get in touch with us through those. Um, Candice has sent out a poll through the Zoom that we'd appreciate if you could fill this in. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how many of you are already um, involved or we'd like to get involved in some of the activities that we have. Um, I guess we have a few minutes left. Um, I was pleased to see lots of questions being asked um, on the, the Q&A bar. So um, I guess I'm just going to have a look through and see if there's any particular interesting. So um, Dave, you talked a bit about um, automotive. So there was a question about automotive saying, um, do you think adaptive Autosar can also work with UXL? Um, I guess, you know, that's one um, area where you know automotive is is innovating and and, and developing platforms for for that space. Did you um did you want to add anything to that, Dave? Uh, no, but if there's proposals there, then yeah, we'd be interested yeah. in hearing them. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote an answer and said, you know, we have this safety critical SIG that was recently formed. Um, that's quite closely aligned with the, the SICO safety critical group as well. So we would like to explore what it means to bring the libraries into a, a safety critical environment and, and maybe Autosar is one is one path to do that. But if you're interested in that, you know, I'd encourage you to hop on the Slack or or join the, the safety critical meeting and ask ask some questions about that. Um See what else. Um, I guess it would be interesting to know. There's some questions about OpenCL, Spear V. Um, picking on Robert here, but do you, I guess do you have anything you'd like to say about you know the relationship between UXL and these kind of you know intermediate um, layers? Uh, well, well, I think we kind of said that the we're. The libraries that are part of UXL today uh, sit on top of Sickle, which and, and OpenCL, and um, you know I, I think we there has been a lot of talk lately about the the thing that is below it, and whether it's um, it can just be an OpenCL runtime and then the one API construction kit, which I'm not really involved in, and so I think that that's really a an area of a, a lot of interest right now and what what is the right thing and what would be the easiest way for new accelerators to support a software stack so if that's what you're looking for that's you know that's what we're working on and it'd be a good good thing to to, to join and participate in yeah i, I think the the hardware sig and i guess the slack channels that i talked about um, might be a good place to to come and ask some questions about these things and and help your understanding of how you know all the the layers I guess fit together. Um, I mean, fundamentally, the idea with the libraries is that they kind of abstract away and hide that sort of complexity away from the user. But I guess from a, if you're implementing a new target, then um, you need to understand that. So that's that's kind of the purpose of that group. So um, I'll cover one other one. So um, someone asked. As a vendor with an existing device that appears to be target audience, how should we get started with the initiative? Um, hopefully, you got the join us um, uh, links there. So come on the Slack or send us a message, um, or even complete a, a membership form, and and um, and you'll you'll get more information about um, about that. And um, hopefully, within some of the groups, you can talk about what it would mean to add um, uh, a new device to to the projects. OK, well, again, thanks so much to all the steering members that have joined us today. Um, this has been great. Um, been lots of good questions. Um, and um, thanks, everybody, I guess, online for, for joining us uh, too um, and asking all the great questions. And um, I say, join the Slack if, you've, if you want to get in touch with us um, more, and um, we'd love to hear from you. So. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Candice, should we hand it back over to you to wrap us yep. up?
Yep, I can wrap us up. Thank you so much to our presenters for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a quick reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.